And I am uh, preaching today on thankful for dot, dot, dot. Thankful for. I'm kicking off a brand new series next week, a Christmas series called From Magi to Manger. And uh, I'm excited about it. But we got a one-hit wonder this week. If you don't know what a one-hit wonder is, a one-hit wonder is a, a sermon that I preach that has nothing to do with a series. It's just kind of like a standalone. And of course, last week celebrating Thanksgiving, I thought thankful for sounded completely appropriate. How many, by the way, uh, ate way too much on Thursday? Anybody you ate way too much? How many of you have the the same, babe, the leather jacket today was a good fashion choice. Horrible, horrible preaching choice. Uh, (laughs) Dear God. (laughs) We need a move. (laughs) I'm some more AC. We stand right in front of this fan right here and just. All right. So how many of you have those situations on Thanksgiving where you eat? And you're full. And you say out loud, if I eat another bite, I'm going to (laughs) puke. To which that is followed up by pass them rolls. If I eat any more, I'm going to puke. I Just some more pie. Just some more pumpkin pie. You know, it's one of those situations. And I was thinking about this week. I was thinking about Thanksgiving, which is Thanksgiving, giving Thanks, And how interesting is it that Thanksgiving is all about giving thanks, but the one thing we do is forget to give thanks. Doesn't it feel like uh, as a culture, we have just totally kind of even skipped over Thanksgiving? It's uh, Halloween's over, November 1st, Christmas. (laughs) I mean, we put up our tree in October. I'm, I'm, I'm just ready. And I was thinking this week, I'm like, man, we have Thanksgiving to give Thanks, and what Thanksgiving has become is I can't wait to go to family's house or not go to family's house or uh, watch football or Black Friday sales or it's, it's anything except sitting around the table and giving thanks for what you've got. And I started thinking this week, I thought, man, as a culture, if I'm honest, I think what's happened to a lot of us in this selfish nature innate in all of us that's bled into our culture, into our world, is the fact that we've just forgot how to stop and give thanks. Because a, a lack of gratitude will always give you a thankless attitude. And I think we live in a culture today, if I'm completely honest, that we just for, we've forgotten how to give thanks. We've forgotten how to thank other people, thank God, thank families, thank employers, thank employees. We've forgotten how to thank because we've just been so full of thanklessness that we have forgotten how to have an attitude of gratitude. And I, I was thinking this week, that gratitude actually means I have so much. Greed means I just need more. So maybe it's not an attitude of grateful, maybe it's an attitude of greedful. Where it's not an attitude of, I just have so much this year, it's the attitude of, if I just had what they had, I'd be happy. It's the attitude of, of, of gratitude that we, we seem to be missing. Let me say it like this. Have you ever been so focused at the mission that you're on you forgot to be grateful for the moments that you're in. You you know what I mean? You're you're on the mission and you're so focused on the mission of your job, the mission of your family, the mission of your work. You're so involved in the mission that you're on, you never stop to be grateful for the moments that you're in. Because it's always, basically, we just can't wait to get to the destination, but we miss being thankful on the journey. And the journey is what gives you the attitude of gratitude to be thankful once you get to where you're going. I remember as a a church when we first started, we we met for the very first time. We had 20 people at our first interest meeting ever when we started Anchor Church. And I couldn't wait for the day we had several thousand. And I talked to a buddy of mine. He goes, bro, it's the thankfulness that's built over the time that the church comes together. It's not all of a sudden you have 20,000 tomorrow. It's the journey that makes you thankful for the 20 in this room. You forget. Let's say it like this. I remember when Teresa and I got married. And and, uh, over 25 years ago, babe, woo, 25 years ago. And I remember we were so focused. Many of you that are married know what I'm talking about. You're so focused on getting married 
you're so focused on ordering flowers and renting chairs and getting tuxes and you're you're so focused on the ba- you're so focused on all of the things it takes to pull the wedding together if you're not careful you miss the fact that you're getting married like i, I i'm honest I, I don't think i even remember a person that was at our wedding Like I feel like I remember walking. Down, I remember walking down the aisle, seeing Teresa walk down there. I'd be like, "Man, she's she's hot." And I remember seeing that. <laughs> but but I remember going through. I remember waking up the next day and going, "Babe, we're we're married." <laughs> like like because you get so focused on, on on the mission of marriage, you forget having joy on, on the moments of marriage. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can get so focused on the destination that we, we miss being thankful on the journey. And I read a story this week, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach on it today. And I guarantee you, uh, you've, you've heard this story. You've heard a preacher teach this story. You've probably read it in a devotional. You've probably heard me preach on this. If you have never been in church before, you've probably heard stories of this story. So it's not an original, but as I read it this week, it opened my eyes to some originality in it that made me think, Sean, you're just not thankful. And and, and I started thinking this week that if you don't stop and give thanks for what you've got, you'll think you'll deserve what isn't yours. If you're never thankful and just pause and be thankful for what you've got, you'll find yourself wishing you had something you never deserved. That's where our story takes us today. In the New Testament, Luke chapter 15, it's known as the lost chapter. And it's not because it was lost and is now been found. It's because it's all about lost Things, but what it shows you is the person that's searching for the lost thing. You have a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. And what's interesting is everything is lost, but the per- person searching for that which is lost never stops searching until it's found. And the story in Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11, says this. Now, to illustrate this point further, Jesus told them another story. A man had two sons, and the younger son told his father, I want my share. Somebody say, my share. My share. Interesting. It wasn't his at all. I want my share of your. It got me this week. I've never noticed that. I want my share of what I don't own. Because gratitude can't be, gratitude, unless it's experienced, will never be expressed in love. And what happens is this son never actually realized what he really had. And he says to the father one day, I want my share of your estate now before you die. See, you look about those days, what would happen was, I, I started, I told Teresa, I did so much study this week on uh, Middle Eastern culture, Middle Eastern literature. Never before this time of Jesus telling the story and never after this time, ever after this time in Middle Eastern culture has it been known then or known now or known ever that any son would ever ask his father for his inheritance before the father was dead because a son Asking his father for his inheritance before the father was dead was the son saying, I wish you die. And there's too much respect from the sons for the fathers. But in this instance, the son says, the youngest son, which by the way, the older son is always the one that's privy to the estate. The younger son is never deserving of anything. But yet the younger son says, I want my share of your estate before you die. Now here's the crazy thing. So the father agreed and divided the wealth between his sons. Two things we notice significantly right in just these couple verses. You have a son that is a greedy son of a gun. What we notice in this passage already, if you've never noticed that, you hate him, don't you? Already you're like, jerk. (laughs) 
you want your share. You feel yourself already when you heard the story, you were like, oh, I, I, you heard it in the room. Oh, oh. Two things. The son is greedy, but the father's giving. The father says, okay, no fight, no argument. I want my share of your estate. Okay. Now the story goes on. A few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings with the dad's money and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. And about that time, which by the way, stop and pause, about that time, when you get what you don't deserve, be thankful that you get what you actually do deserve because when you get what you don't and you go and squander it, you'll always go back to the father wanting more. The Bible says about this time as money ran out, a great famine swept across. Isn't that just about the way it works? When you start getting all you think you deserve, famine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> swept over the whole land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer, farmer to, to hire him, and he sent him out to the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave it. The pigs wouldn't even share their stinking food. <laughs> like, you know, life is bad when you're like, can I? No. <laughs> you know, like, you know you're in a bad place when pigs don't even share. The Bible says this. And when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired hands have enough food to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. I want you to see something really, really quickly that I never saw until this week. What sent the son back to his father was not repentance. It was starvation. Because notice... What does the son say? I'm hungry and my dad's servants have food. He didn't say to himself, oh my gosh, my father is so great. I am so thankful for my father. I just need some stinking food. But you'll notice the narrative shifts. Even though what took him back to the father was starvation, what actually embraced him and his father was the father's grace and his repentance. But that changes because the son says this. Look at the story. I'll go home to my father and say, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, which lets me know this giving father was looking for his greedy son. He was looking and he embraced him and kissed him, which by the way, Middle Eastern culture, grown men don't run. That doesn't happen. Homeboy in sandals and a robe, doesn't happen but do you know what they would do to run they would take their robe and tuck it into their belt how undignified is that and he probably took off his sandals and he booked it to his son why because in jewish culture there's something called kizaza kizaza is a way that in jewish culture if a son left the father and brought disgrace to the family name if the town of villagers came out and met the son first or the child first, and broke large stone pots in front of the son, that means you're never allowed to come back here again. So the father's looking for his son because he doesn't want his son to be an outcast of the village. If I could just get to him before anybody else kicks him out. So he returned home. The father ran, embraced him, and kissed him. Do you think the son was expecting this is the kind of greeting I'll get? Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice this is repentance kicked in. Remember, he said, I'll just go back and ask to be a hired hand. That never came out of his mouth. It shifted in that moment. He goes, oh my gosh, my dad's glad to see me. But his father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf. We've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost and now is found. So the party began. But meanwhile, there's an older son, and he gets ticked off. And the father goes out and says to the older son, your younger son is home. Come and join the party. And the older son's like, uh-uh. Another instance, you have a giving father going after a greedy son. One son wanted the money. One son wanted the power. 
but the father went after both. Now, this is what I started thinking about in this story this, this past week. This story makes me really, really thankful. It makes me extremely thankful. And if I look at myself in, in the, the younger son's spot, I'm just so grateful for so many things in this story. And can I just preach to myself this morning? And maybe you'll get in on a little bit too. But I just preached to myself this, this week because I go, Sean, Sean, you are so thankful for some thir- certain things based on this story. And first thing, I'm thankful for the father. Do you know why I'm thankful for the father? Because he shows me whose I am. The only reason why the younger son was even able to ask was because he had a relationship with the father. Doesn't matter if the relationship was good enough. The father thought it was, but the son took it for granted. But the father shows me who's, who, who's I am. He had this relationship with the son. I, just, I, I wrote down some things that I think is just completely unreal about the father. The father gives the son what isn't his, doesn't fight with him, doesn't argue and say, no, no, please stay. Just let me keep my money. Stay with it. He looks for him daily, runs to him, kills the best calf for him, spends money to throw a party for him, throws a party for him, never brings up ever again. Where'd the money go, son? And then goes to the older brother. In this story, Luke chapter 15, 11, uh, chapter, uh, verses 11, what you see is this. The father's generous. He's committed. He's connected. He's loving. He's merciful. He's faithful. And the father is fun. <laughs> You're back. Oh, let's party. Let's go. Kill the calf. All you people think God's boring. I have a fun father. I love the fact that he, but here's the thing that caught me off guard. Can I, can I preach for a second? This is the part that caught me off guard. This, I, I've never noticed. You know what I'm thankful for? I couldn't, find a, I couldn't find a fun phrase for this. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm so thankful that the father gave the son freedom to take what wasn't his. What makes me so thankful for the father is that he gives us the freedom. He gives us, let me say it like this. Sometimes God permits what he hates to accomplish that which he loves. Sometimes God lets you go just that far when you want to so you'll recognize how great he really was. No one ever talked about it. How thankful I am for the father that didn't create robots. You know what robots do? What they're told. Anyone ever seen the movie Finch or whatever it's called? Robot created for one reason. He did whatever Tom Hanks told me. You do what I tell you. You're a robot. Robots do. Yes. Yes. Robots do what you tell them to do. Children of God do what they're taught to do. Do you know how your faith is built? Your faith is not built in the telling what to do. Your faith is built in the teaching what to do. This father did not raise robots. He raised children that had the freedom to make their own decisions. And the father said, if this decision that you're making to leave me, even though I hate it, at some point in time in your life will let you recognize just how good I am, maybe you'll come back. Because you, you, you teach And then you have to give the freedom to live. And many of us are living proof today that, my God, we have walked so far away given the freedom from the Father that we thought was great, but we actually realized it was extremely bad. I think about when my son Austin was growing up, turned 16, I was teaching him how to drive my stick shift. And we went to the, the church parking lot, because I don't know why, that's where everyone goes to learn how to drive church. <laughs> I guess because if you hit something, it's you're in church. Um, and I remember teaching him, and, and I teach him and teach him and teach him. I would teach him how to parallel park. I would teach him how to park. I would teach him how to back up, teach him how to shift gears, teach, uh, teach him, teach him. But then eventually, at some point, I had to give him the freedom to go on the open road hoping as a dad I had taught him all the right things and given him the right experiences and right lessons and then send him out so he would actually be able to practice what he was taught. 
if God taught us all these lessons of faith and obedience and commitment, but never allowed us the freedom to go on our way, then you and I would be raised as robots and it'd be forced and not faith. But God doesn't force affection on us. All he says is, I wanna show you how good I am and then let you see. And what I love is that the, 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 the kid who's eating with the pigs, even though he doesn't say it, the Bible says he rationally begins to go, wow, my dad's good. He even takes care of his servants well. And many of us just today, if I'm honest, we need to be thankful for the father. I mean, maybe you haven't stopped for a long time and just said, I am so thankful for the father. Because even though I ran away from his love, his love never ran away from me. His love never fails, it never gives up. Look what Psalm 63 says, your unfailing love is better than life itself, how I praise you. Psalm 67, my victory and honor come from God alone. He's my refuge, my rock. He never leaves. The younger son left with what wasn't his, but he always knew in the back of his mind, just maybe my father, because I'm his, will bring me back. So if I'm honest, I'm thankful for the father. Anybody thankful for the father today? I was preaching myself. You know what else I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for the father. I'm thankful for the famine. Because the famine shows me what I had. I, I am so thankful for, the, some of you are like, Sean, that is morbid. <laughs> what do you mean thankful for the famine? Are you talking like a, like a physical famine? That's what we're talking about? No, I'm talking about a spiritual famine. I'm talking about a famine where you went without God and then realized that he's all you had in the midst of everything you lacked. Because what happens here with the son is because of the famine that he realized he had a great father. Isn't it just like life when you're never thankful for what you have until you don't experience it anymore? You know when I recognized how stinking great my mom's cooking was? My freshman year of college eating ramen. Not one time did I sit down when I was a kid at meal and go, Mom, this pot roast. (laughs) But you sit down to that meal of ramen for the third night in a row. Oh, dear God, my mom's pot roast. (laughs) You never realize how awesome it was that your parents paid your bills until you pay your own. (laughs) You never realized how free it was to do laundry until you're putting $7 in that machine and buying your own laundry detergent because you went from using fabric softener to I don't care. You know what I'm talking about? You didn't realize how great that bed was until you're on a sheet of plywood. You don't realize how great your family is. You don't understand how great your father is until you're sitting in the famine. Because my lack of makes me realize my love of. And in that famine, the son recognized, holy cow, my dad is good. My dad is just so good. 
Romans 5, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strength of confident hope. What is the Sean Blakeney translation of this? I'm so thankful for famines because it drives me back to the Father. I'm so grateful. I'm going through difficult times because when I go through difficult times, it reminds me that I can't go through a difficult time on my own. I need Jesus to help me get through this difficult time I'm in. And so I'm thankful for the famine because it drives me back to the Father. Do you know why I treat my wife like gold? Because I was engaged to a girl before her that wasn't. When you recognize in the famine who you always had, it drives you back to the Father. Amen. And some of you, I'm just, some of you, maybe you're joining us in this room or joining us online, and here's what you're saying. I've been in a famine for six years. I hate the famine. How long will the famine last? My answer to you is when you recognize how great the Father is. Isn't it interesting? We complain about a famine we asked for. We complain about a famine we left for, and then it's God's fault. But God's working. So I'm thankful for the Father. I'm thankful for the famine. But y'all know what else I'm thankful for? The stinking feast. (laughs) Y'all, can you imagine homeboy running back to his dad? Sitting down at that feast, I bet he was sitting at the table going, yesterday the pigs wouldn't get me food. Today I got dancers and a calf. Let's go. He had the feast all along, but because he didn't have an attitude of gratitude, he walked away to a famine. The interesting thing is when you give your heart to Jesus Christ, you always have a feast. You may not have the seat at the table you want, but thank God we're at the table. Do you know what I'm never satisfied with for some reason? My seat in an airplane. (laughs) Can I get a witness? You know what I'm talking about? Like I'm, I'm on a window seat and I wish I had the middle. I'm on the middle, I wish I had the aisle. I'm on the aisle, I wish I had the exit. I'm on the exit, and wish I had first class. I'm in a first class window, wish I had a first class aisle. The meal comes for first class, and you're like, what, no steak? I'm out of this place. (laughs) Isn't it interesting? You're never satisfied with the seat that you have, and if you're not careful, you'll never be satisfied with your seat at the feast. But the same table that you're sitting at is the same table the Father's at. So your seat doesn't matter. The table has everything on it you need. It has everything on it you need. Remember when you were were a kid and you're at the little like Fisher Price table and all the adults and you wish to yourself, I just stink and wish I was at the adult table and not at the ping pong table talking about Barney with 12, you know, And then you get to the adult table and you're like, what I wouldn't give to go back (laughs) to the stinking kid table. I'd talk about Barney all day. Your seat doesn't matter because it's always around the same table. Stop being so frustrated on what you can't do and give God thanks for what you can. Stop being so frustrated about somebody else's seat and just be thankful that you have one. Philippians 4, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all my needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to me in Christ Jesus. So this week, I am so thankful for the Father. I am so thankful for the famine, and I am so thankful for the feast. Because it always reminds me of how good my Father is. 
quick action steps. Anybody want some quick action steps? Real quick, real quick. Here, here we go. How do we, how do we always stay thankful for the Father? How do we always stay thankful for the Father? Here, here, listen to the Father. Listen to the Father. Imagine how different this story would have been if the son would have just asked the dad, hey, dad, I'm thinking. Could I get my share? What do you think, dad? And the dad might have gone, <laughs> your share. <laughs> yeah, you got no share. If I give you the money, son, what will you do with it? I don't know, Dad. I don't know. Invest in it? Give to the poor? Give to the needy? I don't think so. I'm thinking about Vegas. I'm thinking about... No, I don't think that'd be a great idea. Good call, Dad. Good call. Good talk, Dad. Good, good talk. Imagine if you and I would just listen to the father we may have never experienced a famine. Imagine if you and I listened to the Father, we may have just enjoyed the feast a little bit more. You want to be thankful? Listen to the Father. Second thing, live for the Father. Do you know why I live in, we live in a culture today that doesn't have an attitude of gratitude? Because it's hard to thank anybody when all we thank is ourselves. Well, they'd be glad they got me. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have this meal on this table. No, if it wasn't for God, you and I would have death. I'm going to live for the one that gave his life for me, and I don't need a famine to experience that. I'm going to listen to the Father, I'm going to live for the Father, and I'm going to love the Father. I'm going to love the Father. Come on, stand your feet. Let me close with this. This past week, I don't know why Teresa did it, but she pulled out a box of old photos for those of you under 20, there are little pieces like this that have. <laughs> I said, you were like, do you mean like this? No, the photo. And uh, I was going through the photos, right? It was our son's birthday, so Teresa was looking at it. And I, I started looking at all of these old photos. And I, I looked at some when we brought our, our daughter home from the hospital and she was in the NICU unit for a while. She, was, she had a hard time breathing. We brought her home on a heart monitor. And I looked at that picture of us carrying home Alyssa with her heart monitor. And I thought, I don't think when I carried her into my house, I ever said, thank you, God, for letting me bring home my daughter alive. I saw pictures of Austin and and Alyssa with some old school teachers and they were in grade school. And I don't think I ever said, thank you, God, that my kids had some teachers that were actually followers of Jesus Christ that poured into my kids when everyone else turned their back on them. I looked at different churches we were at in our past. I don't think I ever said, thank you, God, for allowing me to be there in that situation because that situation led me to be a senior pastor and plant a church now. But I looked at those photos, and if I'm completely honest, every single photo drew my mind back to thank you, Father. Rhetorical question, answer in your own heart. When's the last time you just said, Phew. thank you, Father? Thank you that I've been through the famine, but I always had the Father to run back to. Thank you, Father, that I always have a feast and a seat at the table when I give my heart to you. So it may not be the seat that I want, but I don't actually deserve one. I'll just be grateful for the feast I've got. But thank you. So what am I thankful for? At the end of the day, I'm really thankful for an amazing Heavenly Father. Anybody grateful today for a God that we can always run back to that's always looking to bring you back in? thankful for. Come on, let's bow our heads. You know, what this story really is about is your heads are bowed. Maybe you're here today and you've never heard this story or you've never heard it taught like this, but at the end of the day, you and I are the son that has run away and Jesus is the father that's looking to welcome us back. And can I tell you, he's looking. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Seek. He's looking. And he is running. 
after you. And maybe you're here today, maybe you've been in a famine, maybe you're joining us online, you've been in a famine, and that famine has you starving. And what you're missing in the, the inner being of your emptiness is a relationship with Jesus. And you just have to say, yes, Jesus, and run back to him. There's a prayer that we pray that basically runs our hearts right into the palm of his hand. We open up the door to our hearts, and Jesus comes and lives inside, and you forever have the Father. And if you're here today, you're joining us online, you've never given your heart to Jesus, but you would say, Sean, I want to give my heart to Jesus today because I need the Father. I want to be thankful for the Father today in an eternal way. On the count of three, if that's you, I want you to just, I want you to be so bold and just raise your hand. One, two, three, just raise your hand. Yeah, awesome. Raise up eyes like you see it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So great. We're all going to pray this prayer out loud together, but if you raise your hands, you just say it a little bit louder. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, today I'm thankful. I'm thankful that you are my Father. So I run to you. I open my heart to you. Live inside of me. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past. I want to be a brand new person. And for the rest of my life, I will live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, Anchor, can we celebrate all those that prayed that prayer? Hey, come on, lift your hands up together today.